Hello, class, and welcome to the Chapter 2 lecture. C++ Basics is a chapter that we're covering. So this is some of the, the base, the meat and potatoes material that you will need for, for doing anything useful in C++. So we're going to cover variables. We're going to cover how to assign values to variables and how to use them. Uh, we're going to cover input and output. So reading information in from the keyboard uh, and also writing information out to the screen to the, you know, the standard out or the standard air objects would basically display text on the screen. Learn about data types and expressions. So these variables have to have data types, be it, you know, integer, be it a decimal value, what we call a float or a double in C++, uh, character, string, which are characters that we'll view. Uh, and uh, expressions as well. Uh, we'll go over control flow and as well as some style, programming style tips. We need our code to be readable and maintainable. We have to be friendly and nice to other people who maintain it after us, after we leave. All right, so variables and assignments, we'll jump right in. So variables, you can kind of think of a variable as a, you know, it's a clean slate. When you create a variable, it can hold a value. You will assign a value to it. That's what it means when it says you, we, write, we can write a number on them. We can change the number, meaning we can assign a new variable, a new variable to them, a new, excuse me, a new value to them, and we can also erase that value. All right. So keep in mind. Remember when I talked about RAM, we said that basically RAM memory, what we call main memory in computing, is a contiguous location of blocks. It's a continuous sequence of numbered blocks. So variables are aliases for memory locations. When you tell the computer, uh, you know, x equals 5, you assign the value 5 to x. Well, the compiler will look at x. It will look at the location in memory for x. x is just an alias to a location in memory. So it will actually write the value 5 to a memory location. Okay. And so, of course, it stands to reason that since they are aliases for memory, for memory uh, locations, we write values to them, we change values to them, and it stops there. We cannot erase the value in that memory location. So even be it null, let's say the value null, some value is always there. Null is still a value. And we'll learn a bit more about null later. So variable names or identifiers or aliases to, vary, to the uh, to memory location. Now, when we choose variable names, we, we have to be careful. First of all, we want to use something that's self-documenting. Let's say we're calculating, I don't know, interest rates for a bank account. We want to name, if we have a, a variable named interest, which represents the interest rate, we want to call it, uh, you know, we want to call it interest or maybe interest underscore rate or something meaningful that is somewhat self-documenting, uh, something that we will remember, something that people that come in behind us will remember. And you may be surprised you'll code something. If you work for a software company, you'll come back and look at it months or years later and not know what you did and why you did it. So this is why this is important. You want everything to be self-documenting and easy to understand or at least as much as possible. Now, in C++, first character has to be either a letter or underscore. Now, with the remaining characters, we can include numbers in there, but they cannot start with numbers. So this is the rule for identifiers. Otherwise, if you try to say, um, here, we'll give you an example. We'll create one. So I'll create a, a test source file. Geez, if I can type, we will anyways. So, int, uh, we'll say my int. Now, what we'll do, we'll say int All right, so the first one will pass the test. The second one, it's going to gripe at me here, and this is line four, five, six. Line six, you see I started 
the identifier with a number. So we'll see that it won't compile. All right, I'll run G++ on it. My output is going to be test.exe. My input file is test.cpp. So will it compile? Oh, no. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Line 6, character 8. It busted me right there at that one. Okay, so proof. You cannot have uh, a number as the first character of your name uh, for an identifier, just a letter or an underscore character. Now, if I move it down, there we go. See, now, if I underscore, underscore one, underscore my int, that is syntactically correct. It doesn't make much sense to us. Remember, like I said, and I'll delete this line here. Remember, like I said, we need to create variables with meaningful names. This is not a meaningful identifier. One, my int doesn't tell me anything. However, it's syntactically correct. So they should compile. Uh, well, all right. Yes compiles and it runs without a problem. Keywords. So we have to be careful when coding. There are keywords in C++ that you cannot use for variable names or for any other purpose for that matter. Um, control statement. For, if, um, while, do, break, go to, we cannot use them outside of their scheduled context or else, context or else it uh, confuses the compiler. Let's say if I come back here, let's take, okay, so we've seen, gosh, there we go. We've seen, we know C out is the output to display, uh, is the uh, operator, is the keyword to display output to the, you know, the standard output. So let's do this. This is an obvious example. Yes, the out equals five. Okay, it ain't gonna like this. Hmm. Well, it's making me into a liar here. Just a that if I break. Yeah, see, there we go. Yeah, so you see the keyword break is highlighted in yellow. So see how it actually can apparently be overridden. Uh, break, however, it will not like because break is used to break out of loops. That's just a keyword. We'll learn more about that uh, in control statements. And that's going to be next chapter. However, just know that break is a keyword. It's a reserved word in C++. So now when I try to compile, it's going to gripe at me. Yep, 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 yep. It's saying, hey, I don't like what you did here. You can't use the name break. Okay, so that's just uh, that's an example of a keyword uh, and how it cannot be used outside of its, uh, of its uh, designed context. Okay, declaring variables. Variable declaration. Before we use a variable, we have to declare it. Otherwise, the compiler doesn't know what it is. They don't know what you mean. So when declaring, we can do a couple of things. We can declare it and assign a value to it immediately. We can also declare then the sign value. We can also, we can declare a bunch of them on one line. We can declare a bunch of them on one line and assign them values. And we can declare on one line, assign some of them values and some no. This is all valid syntax. So here I have a declaration. I'm declaring that there will be an integer named i, and the compiler will reserve 
uh, four bytes of memory for it on my system, and I'm assigning the value zero. I'm declaring an integer j. Then, and the compiler reserves an area of uh, four bytes of memory for this integer. Then I tell the compiler, hey, push zero into the memory location referenced by j. Here I declare two ints, k and l. Okay, the compiler reserves four bytes of memory for each. Doesn't do anything with the, with the memory there, but it reserves those four. And here I have two, notice the, the comma. So you can have a list, you can have a declaration list as long as you comma separate them. So I have int m equals zero, n equals one, okay? So I tell the compilers that four bytes of memory aside for m, four for n, and go ahead and assign zero and one to them respectively. Then here, that is you can mix match, you can mismatch, uh, mix match them rather. You can mix declarations and declaration assignment um, combinations here. Okay, and this will compile. Yep. All right, so just know you can do all of this. Now, one pitfall maybe is some people will put a semicolon here. Some people may do that. And this is an error. Do you see why? Remember semicolons and statements. Here you have, you're declaring an integer named O. Then you're saying, hey, P equals 2 because this is a separate statement. Compiler doesn't care about, about uh, line. So it's going to say, okay, this, this statement is done. Now I'm on to the next statement. The next statement says P equals 2, but what's P? I don't know what P is. So be aware of what we would have to do. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll show you that it, uh, it's not going to like that. Oh, no. Yep, P was not declared in this scope. So it says, okay, I declared an integer O. Now what? Okay, now I found 2 to P. Well, what's P? So we would have to go back in here and change this semicolon back to a comma. Small example, but it proves the point. And we compile, everything's fine. All right, so here we have an example, int number of bars. And we also are declaring a double, which is a double floating point precision value, double precision. So basically, eight, well, it's compiler dependent. The size of your variables are compiler dependent. Uh, you can't actually say without looking at the, uh, at the source, the size of this. So I believe there is the size of operator. Size of, we'll say O. Okay, we see O is an integer. So let's say we want to look, okay, so what's the size of our integer? And what's the size of a double in this particular architecture for this compiler? Survey says, four for the integer and eight for the double. Yes. So that means that the compiler has to reserve four bytes for each integer and eight bytes for each double, for each floating point number. All right, so int, of course, means integer, okay? Integers are whole numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, blah, 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 negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, here we this is a this is a variable identified as number of bars that is an integer, and of course a double is a decimal. It's basically a whole number with a decimal component. 
So you have some examples of 1.34, 4.0, negative 345.6, etc. Uh, and you see that up here the declarations of, of the two doubles uh, are for one weight and total weight are going to be the two identifiers, notice separated by a comma, uh, that are type double. All right, so what we can do, you can declare variables immediately, variables that you know you will need throughout the program, generally you declare immediately, okay? At the top, at the top of your scope. Then variables uh, that may be used only in, in one portion, let's say inside some obscure loop, some loop way inside your code, you will tend to declare them immediately before you need them. You see here we have the example of a, an integer sum that's used once to total two scores. So you have your ellipses representing code before this, then some code after that, before the return statement in the uh, in the function. So these are kind of your two your two styles here, your two choices. Neither is necessarily correct as long as you declare before you use. Just remember that uh, you know variables we may use throughout this block of code you want to put at the top. So yeah, as we saw, we, we saw, you know, int, int one, int two, etc. You have your you have your variable type, then you have your identifiers and even optionally assignments separated by commas. Terminated of course with a semicolon which is which denotes end of statement. So here you have some examples. We saw some examples. I coded to double average, M score, total score. Uh, we have a single double here, mean distance. We have two ints, age, number of students. We have a single int here, cars waiting. By the way, there are 99 slides here, so we're we're moving along here. I don't want to bore you with a, a two, two and a half hour lecture. And these are simple enough concepts that uh, simple examples give the give the idea here. So now we can assign values to these variables. So when we assign the variable, the, or the thing that we're assigning to the assign E is on the left side of the statement. And the value to be assigned is on the right hand side. So what this statement tells the compiler to do is, okay, add one weight, add the value from one weight to the value from number of bars push that resulting value into total weight. For clarity, yeah, you could even think of it as within parentheses, one weight plus number of bars, right? Because parentheses just kind of show you that we're forcing the evaluation in this particular order. Assignments end with semicolon. All statements in C++ end, end, end with semicolon. You don't put semicolons after loop. There are a couple of, of places that you don't put semicolons. However, all statements end in semicolons in C++. So yes, on the right on the right hand side of the assignment operator, this is the assignment operator. Uh, we can have constants. You see, we can have just plain constant written down a number or a character, whatever, depending. You can also have variables, as we see. This works. Uh, and we can also have expressions. We can have, uh, you see up here, expressions to variables added. You can have, here we have the example of a variable multiplied by a constant. Any of these are legitimate. Now, warning, you do not compare with the equals operator. This is the assignment operator. This is saying, Add three to the variable number of bars and assign the resulting value to number of bars. So this increments number of bars by three. Okay, this is not a comparison. Comparison operator we will cover in a little bit is two equal sign. All right, now when you declare a variable, now I, I don't agree with this here. What this tells you is declaring a variable does not give it a value. Well, I, I don't really agree with that. You don't know what value's in there. 
it doesn't assign a value. However, you don't necessarily know what value is in there. Check this out. Okay, so what I've done is I've declared an integer, a double and a character, and given them no value, given them no initial values anyway. Compile, and let's see what we got. All right, so we got zero. You know, here, let me go back in here so we can see a good separation. Uh, of these variables. All right, so now they won't be all crowded together. You see, I put a space between them. All right, so I've got my integer was initialized with zero. My double was initialized with a very heavily negative value. And the character, I don't know. It just doesn't display anything at all. So uh, I don't really necessarily uh, agree that it won't have a value. So you can assign it a value when you create it or afterwards. All right, just as I coded earlier, I could say double MPG equals 26.3, or I could say double MPG, tell the compiler to reserve space for double, and then push the value 26.3 into MPG. Either one, kind of the same. Uh, if you can, I prefer assigning them at creation time because I'm, I'm a fan of code brevity. We don't want a, a thousand line program where 300 lines might work. However, don't sacrifice readability for brevity. Okay, if it makes the code unreadable, then go ahead and do longer version. All right. So, yeah, this is basically the same thing here. Uh, this is more unusual. I don't see this much. Uh, usually, you'll see an explicit assignment such as this and not this here. You usually don't see the parentheses. At least I don't too much. All right. So the conclusion, uh, declare and initialize two ints to zero. Then declare two variables, one in and one double. And uh, initialize both to five. So I'm going to leave this as an exercise to you. You can do this uh, based on what we just saw. Good variable names for identifiers to store. Just remember, Variable names can only start with a letter and underscore. Then after that, you can include numbers. However, uh, you cannot have any, any character in there that is not an underscore, a letter, or a number anywhere in the variable. Okay. Input and that. Actually, you know what? This is good. Let's go ahead and, you know, let's go ahead and do this review. We'll, we'll take this challenge. Okay, declare and initialize two integer variables to zero, feet and inches. We'll go ahead and do this. I changed my mind. All right, we can do this a few ways. We can say feet equals zero, inches equals zero. Or we can say int feet inches, and then say feet equals zero, inches equals zero, right? I'll stick with the first way. Then, going to have two variables, one int and one double. Aha, you see the trick they're playing on you. Both should be initialized to the appropriate, to the appropriate form of five. So what they want from you, uh, did we give did we given instructions for name? No. So we'll say int, you know, my int equals five. Now the double, what they want to see, what the author wants to see is something like this. Remember a double has a fractional portion. So they wanted to make sure that you understood that a 
double has a decimal part. And give good variable names for identifiers to store the speed of an automobile. We'll code this in here too, just for fun. The speed of an automobile and hourly pay rate. Okay. And we usually measure uh, speed in miles per hour, right? There we go. An hourly pay rate. Uh, that's going to be a floating point value. So what can we name that? What would be good and identifiable uh, hourly rate, right? Something like that. And the highest score on an exam. It's most likely going to be an integer, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, blah, blah, blah. Uh, highest, what do we call it? Highest score. That might be a good identifier, right? And, uh oh, entries were not declared in this scope. Ah, you see, I did my own, I, 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 uh, I was victim of my own pitfall there because I told you not to do this. So in this case, do as I say, not as I do. Int seat, what did I do here? That's right. I put a semicolon instead of a comma. There you go. So, in other words, the fact that it compiles means that what I did was syntactically correct. Syntax is okay. Okay, I O. All right, data streams. So we have input and output streams. Input, of course, are read in from, say, the keyboard or maybe from a file in later chapters, I think chapter six. Output can go to the screen, the printer. Okay, it's typically in the form of characters or numbers. That much is intuitive. Uh, input streams. Yeah, to a program, you'll, you'll generally get, uh, you can generally get keyboard or file input. We can type entries in or we can read entries in from, say, a file. Okay, output generally goes to a monitor, or you can redirect output to a file. Uh, you know, so this argument could be made that, you know, a printer would be output as well. C out. Now, C out is the output stream. Okay, that's your standard output stream. So you'll see C out followed by the insertion operator, followed by the stuff that we want to output to the output stream. So in this case, what we're doing, we're saying display, send to my output stream, the value of the variable numbers of bars, followed by the string, which is a string of characters, candy bars, followed by a new line character. That's what the backslash N is. So let's check this out. All right, C out. Here, let's say uh, double B equals 1.0. So I'll, I'll initialize, declare and initialize a floating point variable. It's initialized to 1.0. And so I'll say, I'll give it a string. These double quotes are the beginning of a character string. So the value of the double B is now between each object that I want to send to the output stream, I need to tell it again, hey, go ahead and redirect this to the output stream as well. So you see what I've done here. Send to the output stream, the value of double B is followed by the value of B. And I've made a little tiny mistake here on purpose to show you. The value of double B is one. Well, uh-oh. 
Okay, that kind of didn't look kosher, did it? Let's see. Let's go back in here. We can do better than that. And I'll follow it by the end line. So I can do it one of two ways. I can I can output explicitly an end line to the output stream, or I can output, as I said, the new line character. Same thing. Okay. So that should improve our display a little bit. We saw junk ran together there. So let's try this one more time. The output of the double B is one. Hmm. Well, we can do even better than this. You see we ran is and one together. And I did that on purpose because this is a very common mistake as well. I make it all the time myself still. Uh, Got to put a space there, right? So now the value of the double B is space, and then it will give us the value of the double B. Uh, okay, so the compiler can't interpret what we mean. It only does what we tell it to do. Now we should see a good result. Allegedly, theoretically. Yep, there we go. The value of the double B is one. And the compiler doesn't really care about white space, doesn't care about line breaks, doesn't care about spaces, as long as they're not spaces within a string. So what this is telling you is that you can separate this into two different statements. And the output, the result will be the same. And we'll see this. So now, instead of this, what I can do is let's mix it up. We'll create three whole different lines. All right. So now we got the value of the double B is B followed by a new line. Okay. So this is three separate statements. However, it's going to be executed the same as the single statement. So just keep in mind the compiler doesn't care, it ignores white space, okay? Uh, number one, it ignores white space, and number two, it doesn't care uh, that these are repeated C out statements because this is the same as saying this, right? And yes, you can also put expressions. You can put expressions in your output. I can come in here and easily say something like value double B is uh, uh, eight plus six. Since I have not surrounded eight plus six in double quotes, it will not print out eight plus six. So what will it print out? It should print out 14, right? Because this is an expression. This is not a string at this point. There we go, value of the double B is 14. And that's actually not the value of the double B. It's a little bit misleading because if we look at it, that doesn't have anything to do with B. That's just uh, the addition of two integers. So it's a little misleading what I did there, but you, you get the point. Okay, and yes, strings are surrounded by quotes. These are double quotes. They're not two single quotes. Just be aware of that. Uh, and yes, again, white space only matters when it's within a string. As we saw, I was able to add a space, and we got a space on the output. Okay. Uh, this whole mysterious pound include I.O. stream. All right, so I.O. stream is a library. Okay, it's part of the C++ library. It's not mysterious. It's a bunch of code. So I.O. stream will represent input and output streams. You know, that's why it's I.O. stream. What we can do here, I'll prove this to you. Uh, I know where I.O. stream resides in the computer. Um, I think 
4.8 here. Yeah. Don't worry about this. You don't you don't have to know this. You're not gonna you don't panic. See here's my IO stream. This is the IO stream header. Okay. This is in the namespace standard. Did you see that? Namespace standard. So that's part of you know using namespace standard. This is in the standard namespace. And we'll we'll learn namespaces actually in the next class, not even in this class, so don't worry too much about that. There we go. There we are. C in, C out. There's even C error, which displays data to the error. It's a standard error, which is just an alias for standard output for us and also to a log. So my point here, we don't really we don't really care too much about IO stream at this point. You know, when you get more advanced, you can look at the IO stream code and figure out what it's doing if you want to tinker. However, just know that it is code. It references a library library code on our machine. You see, my IO stream re, uh, header resides at user include C++ 4.8 IO stream. So just know that it's not it's not some mystery magical stuff. It's there. It's code. You use this code to do stuff at a higher level. That's why it's called a high-level language. And yes, that's why using namespace standard is necessary. We saw that it relied on the standard. It was inside the standard namespace. It should basically give a scope for our code. All right, so backslash is the escape character. Check this out. We already saw the backslash n. We'll put a new line on the screen. Now, there are a few of them. We could do a, a, a backslash tab. You can do a backslash t for a tab character. Uh, we can, what else can we do? Uh, aha, backslash, backslash will print a backslash on the screen. Backslash quote, double quote, will print a double quote on the screen. Backslash single quote will print a single quote on the screen. Now think about this. Okay, so we need a provision within a string to be able to include a new line just for convenience sake that's what this n is new line now hey if strings are defined if they're starting and ended by double single uh, excuse me double quotes how the heck are we going to print a double quote inside of a string okay we have our escape character it escapes outside of the normal string constraints and will allow you to print a double quote so anything that follows this backslash character is going to be treated in a special way via the escape sequence. So this is a way to print a double quote. This is a way to print a backslash. Remember, the backslash is the escape character. And so we need a provision to print a backslash sometimes. Let's say we want to print a file path for Windows. Well, we'll need to use two backslashes. Backslash, backslash will actually print one backslash. Backslash T is tab, so tab stop. Uh, what else do they have here? Yeah, they don't they don't really cover a whole lot else, but these are these are some common ones. So what we can do, we'll expect to see the value of double B is, and I'll come down here so we don't confuse ourselves further. And say, hey, it's B. All right. Then we should expect to see a tab space followed by a backslash, followed by a double quote, followed by a single quote, and then a new line. Yep, tab, backslash, single quote, double quote, and new line, right? Because now we're down here, our display, or uh, 
our next line is on the literally on the next line. Format real numbers. Okay, so when we display doubles, of course these zeros are going to be truncated, right? These zeros aren't going to be necessary. So dependent on your compiler, we can say. There, we'll just delete this garbage. We can say we shouldn't expect the compiler to tell us 5.000000. I seriously doubt that that's going to be the output here. <laughs> Just five. It truncated the output, right? Because the, the, the zeros are superfluous. They're they're kind of they're not necessary. All right. So if we give it a price seventy eight point five, you know, C plus plus is not going to know that this is a numerica. This is a monetary value. It won't tell us seventy eight fifty. There's no way. So we have provisions. We have certain flags that we can set. So we will set six point. Notation, that means that we tell it what precision we want it to display. Show point tells us that, or tells the compiler to always display the decimal point. So it displays the decimal point and displays, it displays the displays six point notation up to a certain precision that we specify. So you see here, set f, set flag fixed, set flag show point. And then we just we specify the precision. So now, if we come back in here, let's say I want to display all 50 zillion. How many did I put there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's say I just want to display six of them. We want to display six uh, places after the decimal point. Let's look back here for our syntax. C out dot set flag, set F, iOS fixed. Then we have set flag iOS show point. Okay, so we'll have a fixed display. We'll always show the decimal point. And we will set the precision to six. Then when we display this B, I would expect to see 5.000000 now that we set these flags in precision. Standard has had no, uh oh, what did I do here? Oh, see how about precision, excuse me. I knew that too. All right, there we go. One, two, three, four, five, six. Excellent. So we can control our display and how many decimal point, uh, places we show as well as force it to show all these decimal places, even if it would be unnecessary, uh, even if it would be superfluous, even if they're all zeros. C in. So the opposite of C out is C in. All right. So we know that C out displays uh, characters and numbers to the to the screen, right? So far. Now CN will display, will excuse me, will accept data from standard input, the keyboard. So what we can do is something like this. Let's say we want, now we're getting interesting. See, now we're, we're getting into interesting territory because we can prompt the user for stuff and we can calculate, uh, we can do whatever we want with that stuff, manipulate it, and send it back to the user. So here's an example. Let's say we want to, Simplest example, we'll take two numbers and add them. 
So we want to prompt our user, uh, let's say, enter the first number. Now, see in, get junk from standard input. Notice the difference, out, and then this is in. Get junk from input. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So we'll say, we'll declare two integers first and second. And these are the integers that are going to be added. So we prompt the user for the first integer. I'll accept it in from the keyboard. Then we'll say, okay, please give me the second integer. Now I got the two numbers, right? So we're getting, we got our first number, we got our second number. So what this CN first and second does, it takes the input from the keyboard and assigns the variable, assigns the value to the variable first. Then after prompting for the second number, it accepts the value from the uh, from standard input and assigns it to the variable second. So now we have our two variables. The result. Oh, you know what? Actually, here, you see what I'm doing here. Oh, hold on. Here, this will be this will be interesting. I'll leave that bit fall for us to go over. The result is first plus second and new line all right so we'll compile got to compile every time or else we'll be running an old version of the program enter the first number five enter the second number three the result is eight good all right excellent so you see now we're getting into interesting stuff. We can create interactive programs. You see the example they have here. Enter the number of bars in a package, and you see they put a new line there. I, I don't really agree with that. Uh, I prefer to keep it all in the same line. You see our, our input looked, uh, looked kind of intuitive. Enter the first number. You know, if we put a new line in, then it would look something like... Um, Yeah, eh, you know, I, I don't like that as much. It doesn't it doesn't look as, as intuitive. Okay, uh and the weight of ounces enter the number of bars in the package and the weight of ounces of one bar. You see they still they put a, a new line before the input. So you you enter and, and notice also the way they did this. Enter the number of bars in the package and the weight in ounces of one bar. So you enter one value and then you enter the other value. It doesn't provide pre precise enough instructions because maybe you'll put a space between the variables. Maybe you'll enter a variable and then enter the next variable. It, it's not very clear to the user how to proceed. Reading from CN. So you can uh, input multiple values here. So what we can do, we can revise, enter the first number. We'll do something like this. Um, All right, so we can do something like this. You know, we'll tell the user enter the first number followed by space in the second number because the compiler will, uh, when it receives the input, it will uh, use the white space as, as uh, separators between the, the input and between the variables that you're inputting. So see in first and second. 
See, I can kind of chain these as well. It's not exactly chaining, but uh, you get the idea. CN first, followed by second. And compile to make sure from our latest version of the executable. And the first number followed by space and second number five and four. Result is nine, yep. So just know that. And see, they have three, you can have four, five, six, however many you want. Although again, it's not very good style. All right, and we did prompt, we saw an example of prompting followed by input. And see, notice the absence of a new line before using CN. That's good style, better style. All right, we don't really need to do this uh, this year. We just pretty much did this. We did all of this. So this is an exercise for you. Again, we have 99 slides to cover here. Don't want to drag it on too long. All right, so yeah, 2 and 2.0, they are the same number value-wise. However, you see that 2, what the point they're trying to get across is that there's a difference between the data types here. You know, if we have an integer and a double, they're going to be stored differently by the compiler in memory. Integers are stored as exact values. So you have, let's go to our, our little handy-dandy calculator. Say we have 300. 300 can be represented exactly in binary. 100101100 by weighted positional notation. Now, floating points are more difficult to represent in binary. Numbers of type double may be stored as approximate values due to limitations on the number of significant digits that can be represented. Okay, yes, you can also get, you can get rounding problems. You can get approximations. You can't directly compare two floating point numbers for this reason. And I think this is something covered in later chapters. However, uh, just be aware that two decimal point numbers may not be exactly equal. Let's, in fact, let's see if we can, uh, see if I can give you an example. And this is because numbers are stored as ones and zeros in computer memory. Here, let's uh, throw it for a loop. Okay, so you see what happened here. Let me uh, let me go back in here. All right, so I've got. Oh shoot! Uh, no, that that's right. That's right. So two, two, two. Oh, actually, yeah, I don't have that right. Uh, okay, actually, we, we didn't lose any precision there. Uh, basically, what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to get across, and you may just have to take my, my word for this here, is that we, when we perform operations on, on uh, floating point numbers, because we store decimals as ones and zeros in binary, we can lose precision uh, at the end of the decimal. 
So this means that we can be missing a tiny one after we perform some operations on it. Uh, and two values may not be equal. Therefore, we cannot compare two floating point numbers directly. And that's the implication that this has. Numbers of type double may be stored as approximate values due to limitations on the number of significant digits that can be represented. Depends. Uh, yeah, it depends on the operations that you're performing with the floating point numbers in the architecture. Yeah, integer cannot contain decimal points. The compiler will throw an error at you. Writing doubles. So yeah, uh, it says must. I, I don't think we need to, I don't actually believe we need to. We, we shouldn't need to. Let's go in here. I should still compile, even though I don't have a, uh, a decimal. Yep, see, no problem. So that, that's not true. It's not that it must. It's not a syntax error if you don't include a decimal point. Floating point notation, E means exponent, right? Exponential notation. So, oh, sorry, just a moment. Apparently I'm running low on battery here. Find another plug. Okay, that worked. All right, uh, so yes, floating point notation. Okay, so you can think of this. I'm sure some of you, most of you have taken higher math. You can think of this as 3.41 times 10 to the first. 3.67 times 10 to the 17th, which means that we add 17 zeros. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Yep. 5.89 to the negative 6 means we subtract. We'll, we'll, take, we'll move the decimal point six places to the left. So we should have 1, and then 6 minus 1, we should have 5 zeros to the left of this 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yes. Yeah before the decimal point. Okay, so this is scientific notation. And yeah, it doesn't have to be a double over here on the left side. That's all it's saying. It doesn't have to have a decimal point. Rather, uh, you know, the exponent itself does not contain a decimal point. Uh, times 10 to the needs to be a whole number over here, or else the compiler will not like that. So you know you have small, our data types in C, or C++ range from small to large. You can have one byte data type, so I think a character is one byte. Remember I showed you the size of operator? So we'll look at them from small to large, just a few of them. We'll say, hey, character uh, followed by size of an integer followed by size of a double. All right, so my character is one byte, integer is four bytes, and double is requires eight bytes of storage. And this much is intuitive. If we, if it, if it has a wider range of values that it may store, then it's going to be a larger. It's going to require a larger amount of storage. That particular data type is. So here you go, int, yeah, it's often four bytes. As I said, it's compiler dependent. You can't tell for sure unless you use the size of operator or you can look at the, uh, you can look at the code inside the compiler to see uh, how large these variables are. Short, 
Well, I, and it will depend on your on your uh, architecture as well. So a short is a short int. Usually two bytes. I believe it's I believe it's two bytes on my system. We could we could check it. You know how to check that size of short. Okay, so we oh that's true. Uh, we have floats four bytes. We have doubles double eight bytes, and we also have long doubles, which can store even bigger values. Uh, usually 10 bytes. I believe it is 10 bytes on mine, if I'm not mistaken. We'll check it here. Oh, it's eight. Actually, the long double is eight, so there's really no advantage. It doesn't look like there's any storage advantage in long double on my uh, my architecture here. Okay, so as far as character, care, of course, is the value you saw. Uh, there's a little mnemonic for it. If we look at my code here, yeah, size of care. Or you'll hear you'll hear really even at very experienced advanced developers refer to it as char. So call it char if you want. That's perfectly fine too. Constants. So character constant is just a single letter. You denote you enclose characters in single quotes. Okay. If you only have one character value, you enclose it in a single quote. Now, if you have strings of characters, character strings, they are denoted, they are open and closed by double quotes, as I said earlier. Okay, so this is a string, this is a character. Know the difference, you know, and if we were to do this, that's not right. However, we can do all that over here, and this is still a character string because it's one or more characters. So C++11 is a new C++ standard. I'm not very familiar with it. Uh, however, we see that, yes, of course, we know that, you know, we can tell, I told you, that uh, the size of the data types is compiler dependent. Well, it's machine dependent, really, as well as compiler dependent. Um, yes, C++ has auto promotion. You have an auto type variable sort of similar to uh, dimensional variables in, uh, in Visual Basic. We saw this. Uh, skips blanks and lines. Um, CN will look for white space and it will assume that that's the break between your two inputs. String data type. So, we can actually declare strings, but look at this. We've seen, we use strings so far here. I'll go ahead and delete this line. So, I can say, hello world. And we know that that's a string, that's a character string. Of course it is. However, If I do this, that ain't right, and I'll show you why. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, I'll be darned. It's going to make a liar out of me here. Let me try this. There we go.
you know, I'm going to look into this and see why it's accepting uh, because I don't even have to, apparently I don't even, uh, I don't need, I, I, it appears that I no longer need to include the string uh, library. I don't need to include this, uh, I don't need to put the include statement there for some reason. Yeah, apparently uh, inclusion of the standard namespace is sufficient uh, because I bet, yeah, okay. So never mind, uh, never mind that. We'll just, we'll, we'll skip that. That's not a problem. Now, some of the operations on string may necessitate inclusion of the uh, of the string. Uh, it, may, it may necessitate inclusion of string, so uh, just, uh, never mind this for right now, in other words. But we see that we can declare a string. And perform operations on it, displayed out to the screen, etc. Hello world, hello world. That's what I would expect. All right, so uh, store values and variables of the same type, duh. Now, th there are some exceptions here. So you see we create an int, we declare an int, and then we try to push a floating point value into it. The compiler will at the very least complain to us with a warning. It may give us an error. error. Let's try it. Didn't grab at us at all, in fact, let's see. Okay, so the compiler didn't didn't grab at us. Now, what it did do, though, behind the scenes, it truncated this value to two. It took off, it just whacked off the decimal portion. And we'll see that this is true. Yep, it's two. You see it back, I didn't put the new line in here, so it's kind of concatenated the rest of the output. But you see it, it's two. Be aware. Don't shoot yourself in the foot by doing that, okay? This would need to be a double if you wanted to store 2.99. So, yeah, that's the problem with assigning doubles to ints. You lose precision, and you may not have intended to. You see what they did? They, they assigned 2.00 to an int, so as a result, it's now two, and there's no decimal point. Now, if that were 2.01, we would have lost information, right? All right, so yeah, ints can be stored in doubles. That's fine. You won't lose precision. The double will add, kind of add the decimal point on for you, but you will not lose precision if you store an int in a double. Character to int. So, Character values are represented by their Unicode uh, values. So if we go, we can kind of Google here. Unicode character table. So each Unicode character, Unicode is, is uh, an encoding format here, uh, encoding scheme, 65... Sixty-five hex evaluates to one hundred one decimal. No, I'm sorry, I did that backwards, didn't I? 
Uh -huh. 55 decimal evaluates to 41 hex, which tells us that, yes, indeed. Okay, so A is represented by the value 41 hex, which is 65 in decimal. So you see what they have here, int value A. Now, in memory, you won't have an int you won't have uh, A, you'll actually have, uh, this will be represented by 65, okay? And you can assign the values directly to characters. If you assign 65 to a character, it says, okay, value 65 corresponds to uppercase A. So just know that, uh, know that when you compare, and we'll find this out soon enough in later chapters, when you compare characters and strings, it will compare their Unicode integer values, and it won't, it doesn't care about alphabetical. Okay, so yeah, Boolean value is basically an integer value. Uh, Boolean values are zero or one, remember. So true is represented by the integer value one, and false is represented by the integer value zero, okay? You can assign integers to Booleans as long as they're zeros or one, but you probably don't want to do that. And if it's a Boolean, if it's a Boolean, really, honestly, any non-zero integer is true. Zero is false. So if we have a Boolean, check this out. All right, so I've assigned the value five to a Boolean. And then I'm saying, hey, if this Boolean is true, that's kind of fancy for what this says, then go ahead and print on the screen that it's true. Yep, B is true. So a non-zero value is seen as true for Booleans. Um, Boolean will store truthfully more than zero or one. It will store any value that an integer will store. Zero is false. Anything non-zero is true. Arithmetic. So this is pretty intuitive. Plus, minus, times, divided by. So you see the example here. We're multiplying one weight times number of bars. We're, we're multiplying the values corresponding to those two variables and pushing the result into total weight. So arithmetic can be formed on any number, any number type. Uh, yeah, operand, just as in, you know, algebra and operand is one of the numbers that uh, that is operated on. And, you know, the result, the result is going to depend on the types of the operands. And what this means is that C++ performs what is called promotion. The resulting data type will be the data type of the variable with the highest precision on which the operations are performed. So if we multiply, let's say, an int times a double, the result is going to be a double. C++ does this so that we do not lose precision. So you see here they have an example. Um, what we're doing is we're taking Uh, actually, this isn't this isn't uh, an example of the way they have it here. You see, they have three doubles, and they are dividing two of them and putting the result into the other one. However, I want to show you something. We'll look at uh, an example of promotion here.
All right, so I'm dividing three, right, by six. However, one of these is a double. I'll divide three by six. Divide three by six, and I'll output the result on the screen. Now, since one of these is a double, we should see promotion. Therefore, I would expect the result to be three divided by six is 0.5. And also, what I'll do immediately after that, I'll divide 3 by 6 integer-wise. I would expect, since these are both integers, I would expect the result to be an integer. Therefore, 0.5 truncated is 0. So I would expect to see 0.5 followed by 0. Let's see if I'm correct. L. Oh. Yep, there we go. There you see, I have 0.5 followed by 0, and we'll look again to make sure we understand why that happened. First, we divided an integer by a double. C++ promoted. It said, okay, since one of these values is double, that's, and that's the highest precision, I will go ahead and convert the result of the highest precision possible, or the highest precision out of the operands, which is a double. So 3 divided by 6 is 0.5 if you include the fractional portion. Then, when it did I divided by J, it said, okay, 3 divided by 6 is 0.5. Um, but this is an integer, therefore we remove, we chop the fractional portion off because the highest precision operand is an integer, therefore the result is zero. That's why. Just an example of promotion. And yep, here, this is basically what it did. What they're doing is dividing five by three. Instead of 1.66666, we truncate, we chop that 6666 off, and the result is one. So be aware of promotion. Okay. Don't expect to get a data type that's more precise than the most precise of your operands. Percent is the modulus operator. What the modulus does is it'll give you remainder from integer division. So if you have, let's say you got, it'll give you the remainder. Let's say, okay, check this out. We'll say, we'll look at the example of, One hundred and three. Let's do it this way. One hundred divided by three is thirty-three point three three three. Let me see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. However, so what we'll do, we'll say how many times will three go into a hundred? Three will go into one hundred thirty-three, and then we have a remainder of one. Right, because 3 times 33 is 9, no, excuse me, 99, plus 1 is 100. So this part, our remainder, is what we're looking for with modulus division. So, therefore, 100 modulus 3 should be 1. Do you get that? 3 goes into 133 times. The remainder after that is 1. Yep, there's a, oh, darn, I keep doing that. Anyways, you see, yeah, that's the modulus. Our remainder is one. Modulus is very good for knowing whether a value is even or odd. You know, percent two would give us zero. Percent three, now oh, hold on, let's see here. Any number of percent two will tell us whether it's even or odd. For example, 99% 2 will give us a, a, a leftover 1, which means it's odd. 98% 2 would give us a leftover 0, which would tell us that it's even. 
and you can see that this pattern would repeat. So that's one example. You can also use it for calendars. Uh, the, the modulus is actually very, very incredibly useful, even though it may not seem like it right now. We'll perform some, uh, some operations with this later. Yeah, uh, pay attention to your spacing. Make code easy to read, self-documenting easy on the eye. Precedence rules. All right. So remember that uh, that catchy saying, PEMDAS, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. Right? Those are the, the, the uh, that's uh, the order of precedence. Uh, before that, in the programming world, comes the unary expressions, such as the Boolean knot. Uh, we'll see examples of this in a bit. Just know that you know PEMDAS and then the uh, unary operators are before that. And there's a chart in the book as well. So we can use parentheses to force order of operations. Uh, without parentheses, we go from left to right. We would add x and y. Then we would multiply the results. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Sorry, <laughs> I broke my own rule, PEMDAS, right? So we don't have parentheses here, we don't have exponents here, we have multiplication here, y times z. So we would multiply y and z, and then we would add x. Here, PEMDAS, notice we have our parentheses. So we add x and y, then we multiply the result by z. This, these are two different operations. shorthand. So instead of saying, you know, count equals count plus two, gets a little bit repetitive. Programmers are lazy. What we can do is say plus equals. That's a way of incrementing this amount to this variable. So we don't have to repetitively yeah, type the variable name. Plus equals. Okay, plus equals. It also works, you know, minus equals, times equals, divided by equals, it's all the same. Check it out. We'll do a real quick example. I equals I plus two, now it expected equal two, and then I plus equals two. It's all the same. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, that's not going to work here. <laughs> All right, so we declare an integer i, we assign the value 0 to it, we add 2 to it. Then we add two to it using our new fancy notation. So I would expect the output to be two and four. Uh, what did I do here? Yep, two and four. All right, now control flow. All right, so we can control the order in which the statements are executed, and we can jump around in our program as needed. Uh, branching is where we make the choice of code path execution. So here's an example. If we, we can calculate hourly wages, uh, if we work less than 40 hours, really we're just, it's a simple calculation, right? We'll multiply our hourly rate by our number of hours worked. If we work more than 40, it gets a little more complicated. We need to multiply rate, our hourly rate times 40 hours, and then add our one and a half, our time and a half rate times the amount over 40. So you see the calculation, rate times hours, then you also have rate times 40 hours plus your double time rate times the difference in hours, in other words, the number of hours over 40 that you work. So how do you make the program choose if, right? If 
your hours variable is greater than 40, then you need to go ahead and use your fancy calculation. Otherwise, else, you'll just use your simple calculation. And so here's what it looks like. If hours greater than 40, if, you're at, if the value of hours is greater than 40, if you worked more than 40 hours, then your gross is going to be 40 hour rate plus your double times rate times the number of hours over 40 that you worked. Else, your regular calculation. So if statement to be evaluated, then your code to be executed if that's true, or else, in other words, if this didn't match, else this code is going to be executed. Now, this is seen as a Boolean. Okay, hours is greater than 40 is either going to evaluate to true or false. Now, if it evaluates to true, this is this uh, these statements before the else are executed, or this one statement in this case. If it's false, then we execute the else block. In other words, just this one statement here. However, there can be multiple statements there. Okay, so we can we can say greater than, greater than or equal to, not equal to, equal to, remember that's equal and not assignment, less than, less than, equal to. Yep, so as I said, if, then if it's, if this is true, if this evaluates the true, we will uh, execute everything before the else statement, if there is one. If not true, we'll execute everything in the else block. Now, the brackets are particularly useful when we have more than one statement that we want to execute. Matter of fact, if we have more than one statement we want to execute, they have to be in brackets. After the if for the true portion, then after the else for the false portion. And a little note, I like to do this. I, I do this myself. I don't put the uh, the bracket on new line, but uh, it's recommended both in the Java and C++ standards. So just go ahead and get a, make a habit of doing that, unless you're you're already programming more comfortable with uh, my style. So here is the Boolean AND. So this is how we combine two statements, two uh, Boolean statements. So if I want to say if we've worked more than 40 hours and if, um, oh gosh, if it's 2015, let's say, let's say I want to test for those two conditions. Here, I'll say in hours and year. You know what? I'll go ahead and do this. I'll go ahead and assign the value of 50 hours, and I'll say year 2015. So say if hours 50, remember, equals equals is the assignment operator, and year 2015 then see out. Oops, if hours, hold on here. Better yet, we'll we'll do something a little more likely. There we go. If hours greater than 40 and year year equals 2015, uh, we are using the 2015 overtime schedule. Else. So you see what I did here? Um, basically, I'm saying, hey, if we're in overtime territory for, I don't know, some employee, we haven't we haven't put the rest of the code in here, we don't need to, and if it's currently 2015, then we know that we're using, we have to use the, let's say we passed a new law in 2015, we have to pay according to a new overtime schedule, we will go ahead and print that out. 
if that's the case. Otherwise, we'll print out that we're not using it. So my hours are 50, my year is 2015, so I would expect this to be true. So I would expect to see we are using the 2015 overtime schedule here. Uh, oh, <laughs> you see what it did? I used the assignment operator instead of the comparison operator. There we go, that'll take care of that. We are using the 2015 overtime schedule, yes. So, and we'll combine these truth statements. Both of them have to be true for the entire statement to evaluate as true. Now, this is the Boolean OR. The OR for the OR operator, as long as one of them evaluates to true, our overall statement is true. So, we'll modify this a bit. Come back here and we'll say or all right, so I said if hours greater than 140, which is not the case, or year equals 2015, which is the case, then print we are using. So I would expect this message to be printed now since I'm looking for either of these conditions to be true. So I would still expect we are using the 2015 overtime schedule to be displayed. Yes. So as long as any of the statements are true, it will shortcut the rest, not even worry about uh, evaluating them, and it will, it will execute our if code or it will it will evaluate the true I guess I should say here not so the not can get confusing not negates any boolean expression so watch this Let me clean this up a little bit. I don't want to confuse you. Sorry, just a moment. Actually, an easier way of showing you here. All right, so we know that we know that i equals zero. So what I'm doing is saying, hey, print out the truth value for i is not equal to zero. So I would expect this to be false. i is zero, and we're saying, hey, what is the evaluation on i is not equal to zero? So i is not not equal to zero, correct? So it should. I would expect 
false to be returned here. And yes, we got a false. We got a zero. Note that this gets a bit confusing. Uh, yes, yeah, see, operators can make expression difficult to understand only when appropriate. Yeah, use only when you need to. Yeah, so we can't we can't change the we can't uh, kind of chain these inequalities in this way. These are binary operators, okay? Binary. Don't do this. Okay, this is an error. If we need to do this, we can say if x is less than y and y is less than z. We can't say if x is less than y is less than z. It will confuse the compiler. Remember, and I did this myself, this is the assignment operator and this is the equality operator. This is what we use to test whether two values are equal. This is what we use to assign a value to another variable. It is not a syntax error. This will assign three to X. Be very, very careful. This will give you bad results. You won't know what happened. You'll be scratching your head for a while. Yes, so if we need to use multiple statements after our control structures, we must use brackets. Otherwise, the compiler, otherwise the first Actually, it will confuse the compiler. The compiler will tell you else without a matching if because it will only be looking for the first statement after the if to be executed. Then it will, it will see the control structures having stopped. And therefore, it will find an else and say, hey, there was no if before this because uh, it thinks it's already exited the if control structure. I'm going to leave these as um, as exercises for you. Again, this is a very long lecture. There's 99 slides here, so we'll move along, and we're nearing the end. So loops are when we want to execute code more than once in succession. It may sound strange, but these are very, 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 very common constructs. We may want to iterate over an, a collection of elements. Uh, there can be any number of things we, we want to do with loops. There are a few types of loops, while, do while, for. So we'll start with the while here. While, then we have our Boolean. We have our Boolean expression here. So while this Boolean, each time this loop is executed, the compiler checks and sees whether the, uh, whether the expression evaluates a true. If it does, it enters the loop and executes the code. Then it looks at the Boolean expression again. If the expression is true, it executes the code again, ad infinitum. Now what it will do, it will only stop executing when this expression goes to false. So you see what they've done here. They have a variable named count down. They've initialized it to three. They're saying, hey, while count down, as long as count down evaluates to a value greater than zero, Go ahead and print hello. And then decrement, remember this is fancy for take, the, take one away from, uh, from the, the value of, of countdown. So first we check it in three. We print out hello, now it's two. We check it and it's two, it's still greater than zero. We print out hello, take one away from it. So we printed out hello twice now. So now the value of countdown is one. We look and say, okay, countdown is still greater than one. We print out hello again. We subtract one from countdown, so now countdown is zero. We come back here and check, uh-oh, countdown is not greater than zero. So we, we print out hello three times. I agree with this statement here. So we can code a quick uh, while example. Here, we'll, we'll do it the reverse way. We'll say in i equals zero. While i is a popular counter variable, don't ask me why, I don't know the history behind it. We'll say while i is less than or equal to five, see out, i is less than or equal to five. 
So then what I would expect, how many times should this loop execute? Oh, you know what? This is an infinite loop. I got to be careful here. Okay, so how many times should this execute? Uh, the plus plus is the increment operator. So this basically, here, I'll, I'll tell you what, we'll I'll stick with structures we already know. All right, so. Uh, done. All right, so we. <clears throat> We initialize i to zero. Now we're saying as long as i is less than or equal to five, go ahead and execute this code. So first we check and we say i zero. Yes, it's less than or equal to five. Okay, so we'll add one to the value of i and we'll print this. So now i equals one. So we've printed once. We check i again. We come back up at the top of the loop. Check i again. It's less than or equal to five. Yes. Now it equals two and we print out the message. Now we printed it twice. Okay, i is two, so it's less than or equal to five. We add one to it, now it's three, we print again. Now we print it three times. Check i again, we say, okay, it's, uh, it's three. Add one to it, now it's four. Print it out again. So now we printed it four times. i is 4, add 1 to it, it's 5, and 4 is less than 5, of course. Add 1 to it, it's 5, we print out the message, so now we've printed it 5 times. Now, i is less than or equal to 5, yes, i still equals 5, i equals 5, so it's still less than or equal to 5. Now we add 1 and it's 6. We print the message out the 6th time, we come back up here and say, oh, i no longer is less than or equal to 5, it equals 6. So I would expect to see six lines here. Let's make sure this is true. One, two, three, four, five, six, not six lines, six iterations. I didn't have a new line. So yeah. So this is an example of a while loop. Okay. Yeah, as I said, first you evaluate the Boolean expression. If false, it stops. That's it. Stops executing. Okay, while it's true, if it's true, each time the body of the loop is executed. continues until it's false. And yes, this is true. A while loop will not execute at all if your expression is false on the first check. The loop won't execute, it'll skip to the code past it. While, and then there's your expression. Go ahead and put all your code that's going to repeat each time in here. Semicolons are only used as statements. Yeah, so this is another pitfall here. I think it's probably in the book. Uh, you don't do this. Don't put a semicolon at the end of the uh, at the end of the um, uh, at the end of the, the the last bracket there, it's not necessary. I don't know about a pitfall, but it's uh, it's, it's unnecessary. Do while. Now, a do while is a little bit different. Notice the Boolean statement is at the bottom here. Therefore, a do while loop is used when you want the loop to always execute once, no matter what. Okay. Do this junk while this is true. However, we execute the do, then we check the expression. So you see why it executes always at least once. I think this is called loop and a half in some text. Do flop while. And watch this. Uh, we'll, oops. we'll go back into our test file. do while i is not equal to zero okay this is garbage right 
I equals zero, and I'm saying, hey, do this while I isn't equal to zero. Well, okay, that, that's junk. We know that I is zero. It doesn't make sense. Well, it doesn't matter. It's still going to execute. Do this stuff while this is true. So I'll execute it, and as soon as it stops going to true, I'll stop executing it. However, I always execute before checking the truth value. We'll see this is true. I would expect it to execute that, that uh, loop to execute once. So I would expect to see one. Yep, there we go. I got one high. That's the do while loop. Increment and decrement. So this is these are examples of unary operators. Remember, I said they come first in the uh, you know in the hierarchy in the um, uh, in the order of evaluation hierarchy. Positive five, you know the, the plus is unary. Negative five, negative is unary. These are unary because they're not they're not binary or tertiary. Um, binary operators operate on two inputs, unary on one. You see why? Plus, minus, and it's operating on this five. We have the increment operator, x plus plus. Okay, so there are a few ways of saying this. You can say x equals x plus one, x plus equals one. Remember that fancy syntax we saw earlier? Or you can simply say x plus plus. And so this is called, the language is C++ because, you know, it's, it's a derivative of C. It's basically, it's called C. It was originally called C with classes by Jarni Strustrup, the, the inventor of C++. And so it can be kind of thought of as C plus one. You know, it's kind of a little advancement on C. So hence the pun. So if X equals zero, when I say X plus plus, it's going to equal one. Watch this. I'll do a quick example. Uh, okay, int i equals zero. C out. You know what? Here. I equals, I'll just do some basic assignments. I plus one. Then we'll go ahead and see out i. Then we'll say, we'll use our fancier syntax, i plus equals one, c out, i, create a new line for readability. Then we'll say, i plus plus, c out, i. Okay, so these are all kind of fancy ways of saying add one to i. Okay, so i equals zero. So first I would expect to see one, then, I, then since I incremented again, I would expect to see two. Then since I incremented again using the, the shortcut, I would expect to see three. So look at the way I'm doing it. I equals itself plus one. Then I have this fancy I plus equals one. Then I have my I plus plus, which is just my, my shortcut increment operator. So I expect to see one, two, three is what I'm expecting to see on the screen, right? Yep, bam. And the same, plus plus and minus minus also. Uh -huh. uh, we are pretty much at the end here, so I'm going to go ahead and do this example. So, let's say you have you have fifty dollars on your credit card. You're not making any payments on your credit card. Let's say our interest is two percent per month. So the question is, how many months without payments do you to pass before your balance is over one hundred dollars? So now we're kind of in our in our think it out phase. So let's look at it this way. You know, we'll take compounding and all that crap out of the equation. We won't worry about, you know, compounding anything like that. What we'll say is, all right, we got fifty dollars on our card. Each month we add two percent to it. So that means each month we can kind of multiply that balance by one point zero two. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. Here's a good, good, good case for a loop while our balance is less than 100, go ahead and calculate the new balance for the next month, right? Because we'll calculate our balance with interest, and then we'll calculate the balance with interest on that balance the next month, right? So we'll keep incrementing and incrementing and incrementing, so we can do this inside of a loop, and inside that loop, we can keep track of the number of months that have passed. 
That's what we'll do. Okay? Look at this. Think it out. Try to think it out for yourself. You can put me on pause if you want and come back to me and I'll be waiting. Okay, you ready? All right. So let's say we got we got our balance. Our balance is initially fifty dollars. Okay, our interest rate is 2%. We'll have an integer for the number of months that have passed. So, now here comes our loop. While balance less than 100, I'll just put my closing braces there so I don't forget them afterwards, one foot before the other. What we'll do is we will say I'll go ahead and go to the next month, right? We'll go ahead since we're in the next month. And we will say balance equals balance times one plus our interest rate, right, times 1.02. Okay, so I just thought this out really quickly here. Let me make sure this is correct. We got a balance, we got interest rate 0.02. Okay, we start out at month zero. So as long as our balance, oh, yeah, 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 no, no, no. As long as our balance is less than 100, we'll go to the next month, we'll calculate the balance for the next month, we'll print these values out, and at the end here, On my last month, I want to know which, which month this was and what the balance was. All right. And to take a look at that real quick, you can put me on pause if you don't understand it. Check it out. understand what it does. And here we go. Months. Maybe it was months. Maybe I called it months. That's my suspicion. Yeah, months. Yeah, that's what it did. Let's give it a whirl. Let's let it rip. There we go. So, aha. So at month 36, so it takes three years, right? My balance is almost 100 at month 35. Month 36, boom, I exceed 100. So make sure to pay those credit cards and don't only pay the minimum. Infinite loop. That's what I almost had earlier. Now, an infinite loop is a big pitfall. <laughs> Uh, infinite loop will just kind of keep running and running and running and running and running. So let me give you an example. And this is easy. I can make this happen real easy. Let's say I forgot to put this silly statement in. So all we're going to see is month blop balances 50 continually, right? Do you see why? We never increment our balance. Therefore, our balance never exceeds $100. Our balance always stays $50. So this loop is forever true. Never exit. So here we go. Compile to make sure it's the latest uh, executable version. And oh, my goodness. Oh, what a headache. What a headache. This will happen to you a bunch. Don't worry about it. Just uh, know what an infinite loop is. All right, and conclusion, uh, at least of this section anyways, and then we're pretty much done. We only have programming style to talk about, and that's easy enough. 
Um, yeah, this is going to be an exercise for you. Okay. Um, 10, so as long as x is greater than 0, x equals x minus 3. So it's going to be what? 10, 7, 4, and 1. And then it's going to stop executing. So do you see why? Look at it. Understand it. And if you're using a comparison, x is less than 0. Well, x ain't less than 0. That's your clue. So that's a clue for this second question here. Let's go ahead and, and look at those. Okay, so yes, we need our programs to be readable. If you come back to your own code a few months or a few years later, you aren't going to know what you did. You aren't going to remember, believe it or not, as cognizant as you are at that time, it's going to look like a stranger's work, trust me. And yes, we need it to be maintainable. Okay, we want our code to be readable, self-documenting, and maintainable. So we group like items together as much as possible. Notice here we want to separate non-like portions or grouping. We always indent statements within statements. So with the control structures, we always indent. Always, always, always. If you use NetBeans and some other IDEs, uh, they will indent for you. If not, you need to do it yourself. Okay, like you see, I've been using the Vim editor. It does not auto-indent for me. Uh, I think there may be a setting to do that. I don't remember off the top of my head. I'd have to look at the manual. Braces create groups. So, uh, notice here, braces placed on separate lines are easier to locate. I'm a fan of code brevity, so I don't always use the brace on a separate line for the opening brace. However, that's encouraged. Uh, and yes, we indent within the braces. We want all of our code to be on the, the same um, width in from the left margin. Comments. So that's a comment. You remember I commented out the code earlier. Let me see if it's still there. I think it is. Yep, so I commented out the code. You know, and it's called a comment because it's most common to use it to write comments. This is a program that does blah, blah, blah. So those are mostly meant as comments to yourself or other programmers, okay? So we can have single line comments that start with two slashes, or we can have multi-line comments slash asterisk that are terminated by asterisk slash. This is a multi-line comment. The compiler ignores those. It will not give any syntax or warning errors on comments. Okay, so a word about constants here. If you use the same value in a program repeatedly, let's say, aha, here we go. You, you, oh, here, this is gold. You see what I did here? I created a, my, my interest rate, I created as a constant. If you have the same valuable multiple times uh, in a program, let's say that I did something like, oh, Let's say that I did something like this instead of saying interest. Oh, no. Sorry. And let's say that I use this interest rate multiple times in this file. Well, guess what? If the bank changes policy, let's say I work for a bank, and this is our, our bank code. If the bank changes policy and says, oh, no, our interest rates are now 0 0.03, well, i got to go back through this file. And I got to look for all occurrences of 0 0.02, and I got to change in all the 0 0.03. Not only that, I can't do a, a, a generic find to replace all because I'd have to check all occurrences of 0 0.02 within this file, make sure that they're all correspond interest rate, and change them to 0 0.03. That's poor, poor programming, awful maintenance. 
So what we want to do then, if we use something repeatedly, we want to make it a variable. Not only that, what we want to do to avoid changing this inadvertently anywhere in the program, we want to make it a constant. You can't modify the value of a constant. The compiler will bust you on it. You cannot do it. So that is the value of a constant. Allows to name number constants if they have meanings, and you can change all occurrences. Where I can change this here, let me clarify this. Where I can change this is up here at the top. If it's a constant, I can say, oh, darn, darn, darn. I can, just like that. And that'll change interest everywhere in my program in one fell swoop. And yes, constant is a keyword. Yeah, and convention for a constant is to is all caps. So really, this should I, I'm I'm lazy. Well, I was in a rush. Let me say, I'm always in a rush. So there we go. That's more like it. And yes, you can do this. We just did this. So I leave this as an exercise to you. So this is kind of chapter two in a nutshell. It may seem like a lot of information, but if you do some of the exercises, really it becomes second nature. Uh, so it's pretty easy stuff. There are just a few little gotchas, and that's, that's about it. But this is the uh, kind of the meat and potatoes of everything that you're going to be doing here. So if you have any questions, just ask. Uh, you know, you can always do the examples from the book. You can do extra examples if you like. Uh, ask me any questions that you need. And uh, okay, great. See you. Yeah. See you next time.